Lovely. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Jill. Um, I uh, am a town planner and I'm a supporter of the fantastic uh, Insulate Britain activists. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce you to this webinar on behalf of Zero Carbon Yorkshire. And we have a very strong Yorkshire contingent, which is absolutely fantastic. I have to put in a disclaimer straight away. I'm from Croydon in South London. So, uh, you know, trying to represent the South <laughs> and also on behalf of some, on behalf of Zero Carbon Yorkshire and on behalf of Insulate Britain. Now, Insulate Britain, you may be familiar with um, a number of very brave activists who undertook non-violent direct action, direct action last year on the M25. Uh, those activists are now being processed through the courts. Some of them are taking uh, this civil disobedience into the courts, demanding that the judiciary also consider their own responsibilities at this time of climate breakdown, when we are um, being uh, presented with basically a wholly inadequate response. That's not just Insulate Britain saying that. Um, as the leaders are meeting in Bonn this week, some six months after COP, there's a general recognition that, you know, what was produced at COP, which was something, obviously not sufficient, is, you know, lots, so much of that has fallen by the wayside. Antonio Guterres earlier in, in the spring had talked of a litany of failed promises. And even uh, in the last couple of days, it was yesterday, in fact, John Kerry warning about, you know, if we carry on, certainly I think he was referring specifically to coal, you know, if we carry on as we go, uh, we are cooked, we're cooked. And that was, you know, that's not very statesman-like language, but actually uh, the UN General Secretary, you know, significant weighty characters are wading in with language of uh, alarmed activists. So, you know, this is, it's a very, it's a very serious um, time we're all facing. So Interlake Bitten have been running a series of mostly monthly one hour webinars with the support and in conjunction with some key figures from Zero Carbon Yorkshire and others, including uh, um, those from the Association for Environment Conscious Building. We've had the New Economics Foundation and at our last um, webinar, we had Russell Smith from Retrofit Works. Recordings of those can be found on uh, Insulate Britain YouTube channel. Yes, they have a YouTube channel. I say they can be found. Obviously, it's not that straightforward to find them, but we put links in our newsletter and we can ensure that you are able to get hold of them that way. Um, and in fact, Russell Smith's went in the email reminder that went out today that the link to that presentation. Um, in 10 minutes or so, we'll get to the main event, which Chris Herring, who will I get, he will introduce himself, will then also introduce our panel and be our question master for the evening. And we promise to close promptly at eight uh, with a quick advertised uh, a quick advertisement for our next meeting. But before handing over to Chris, I'd like to introduce you to Roo. Now, Roo is one of those uh, people whom I am in awe of and feel utterly inadequate in front of because there I am recognizing the horror of what we face and I haven't um, uh, uh, yet, I think yet is the word, I'm still uh, on, on the road to taking the kind of action that I think is absolutely necessary. I, going, off, <laughs> going off script here, I uh, am the mother of three now in their 20s children. I like to think if someone came to my door and threatened any of them, threatened their lives, I could, you know, pick up the nearest implement and do them serious damage. Well, actually, the climate crisis is um, presenting, a, you know, a, a very genuine serious threat to their, their future and, and, you know, potentially the lives of, of, uh, of future generations. And I haven't yet summoned up the courage to sit in the road. So enough of enough of my own failings. I want to hand you over to someone who I have huge admiration for. So Rue, if you'd like to explain uh, your personal situation. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, great to see you all here. Um, so I am someone who's done some of the civil disobedience. Um, it's not actually that much of a big deal. That's one thing I want to convince you all of. Um, and yeah, I hope to maybe encourage some of you to, to think about um, crossing crossing that boundary between the industry and uh, civil disobedience. This is where we find ourselves in 
2022. It's, it's very interesting to be in these webinars uh, at the kind of crossover between industry and direct action. Um, it's quite it's an interesting place to be. So I'm hoping to uh, do a bit of that bridging by giving you my story. Um, so I, I actually was a building services engineer um, in a former life about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and for that reason, I've been coming to these webinars because I had an, I've had an interest in the, the challenge of zero carbon housing uh, buildings in the UK. And I used to work in that. Um, and, um, but to be honest, while I was working in the industry, um, I, you know, it started to become a bit painfully obvious that everything that we were doing was pretty inadequate. Um, in 2004, I went and saw James Lovelock speak in Bristol where I was working. Um, and he basically said, the shit's going to hit the fan. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to ask him a question. I wanted to ask him whether, um, you know, is what I'm doing in my career pointless, basically. Um, I didn't get asked. I didn't manage to get my question in. Um, but that was a big question that weighed on my mind throughout my whole time as an engineer. Um, and it used to be quite, it's quite funny. I'd find myself at industry events and sometimes you'd end up having like a dark conversation with somebody i particularly remember one guy kind of like cornering me in the in this at the side of some uh, seminar and just being like this is all going to go to shit like this is all this we're not getting radical enough here um and yeah so I, it felt pretty inadequate to me for a long time. Um, and I was pleased to see when Insulate Britain came around. Um, that was really amazing to me because I could, we all know that that's what needs to happen. And it's kind of the major plank of decarbonisation in the UK. Um, and I was really glad that they'd chosen that very kind of sensible um, legislative demand um, so I didn't actually do Insulate Britain I've just recently done um, an action with Just Stop Oil who have carried on after Insulate the Insulate Britain campaign um, but I was basically inspired to do so by Insulate Britain um, I was in awe of the bravery that they uh, showed by what they did and continue to be in awe of what they're carrying on doing and the, the moral preeminence that they're showing in the courts is just incredible. Uh, people like Diana Warner particularly, it's just amazing. Um, so I, I went to all the Insulate Britain talks and I was too scared to do it at that time. Um, I was mainly afraid that I mentally wouldn't be able to handle um, the actions um, and the whole thing. Um, and that, that's possibly true, actually. The action that I've done is actually, was actually much less um, scary than what Insulate Britain did. Um, so after Insulate Britain, the Just Stop Oil campaign came around. And um, I did a lot of leafleting to get people to come to the talks um, about the campaign. Those talks are called um, Our Responsibilities at, that, at This Time. Um, and if you do anything, if you, or if you just want to do one thing um, to, in the direction of taking direct action, um, please just go to one of these talks, our responsibilities at this time. There's lots of the talks um, online and they're happening all over the UK. Um, so we were leafleting to get the word out for those 
talks. It was quite an interesting, it was quite as very old school communication strategy um, where we literally just stuck up posters and leaflets around and did it door to door, which felt kind of a bit outdated, but somehow it was actually quite powerful because the leaflet is very shocking. Um, and somehow, well, it cut through for some people anyway. Um, and then I don't really know how it happened because I felt, I basically felt morally um, obliged to, to do the action. Um, like I felt like I had a duty to from having been a lifelong environmentalist. And I was like, well, this is it. You've got to step up at some point. Um, and I, but I found it really hard to actually join together um, my day-to-day -day life and the idea of going and doing this thing. Um, so in the end, I just had to make myself sign up for the training because um, I, I just realised if I didn't just make myself do some kind of step, then I wouldn't do anything and I'd just watch the campaign happen like I did with Insulate Britain. Um, and that was actually a really positive thing to go to the training and then just meet a lot of other people. And I hadn't decided to do it at that point. So that's another tip I would say if you are thinking about taking action is to just go to the training and see how you feel about it. Um, and it, it makes the whole thing much more tangible and less frightening. Um, so... I signed up for this action and that was the block uh, oil refineries or well oil depots um, so just up oil is intended to um well I, I haven't got time to go into the demands but um basically we disrupted the the fuel distribution system and it was pretty successful for a short while um um so the the forecourts did actually start significantly running out of fuel in the southeast for a short while and it started to hit the um kind of public anger button that it needed to uh, to start getting somewhere and it did really start getting somewhere and it, it that that strategy could really go a lot further i believe um so basically we just stopped one uh, tanker coming out of bunsfield oil depot in Hertfordshire. Um, I got on top of the tanker and I sat there in the very cold for about 16 hours on the top and we had a arm tube between me and one other campaigner um, and it, yeah eventually the the police took us all out of there and um, arrested us. It was all very civil between us and the police. Uh, it wasn't really intimidating or frightening. Um, the driver of the truck seemed to know that something was gonna happen and really didn't care at all. He just stopped the truck and got out um, and left us to it. Um, so, and then after that, so I've only done that one action. I'm a real newbie actually to all this. Um, so now I've been charged with um, aggravated trespass. I've got my letter um, from the police, well, from the courts. Um, and now I'll be going to court on the 24th of June. And I, ha I have to choose whether to plead guilty or not guilty. Um, the idea of pleading not guilty is to basically take this action further in the courts and arguably the power of this nonviolent civil disobedience <laughs> is um is more actually in the courts because we're what we're doing is putting a lot of pressure on the legal system and on the judiciary themselves and the judiciary are these are very influential people they're, they're a pillar of the establishment um and it's uh, this, I, this is where I find it gets very interesting. The strategy um, is you kind of, in a 
court of law, you can't get away with all of the denial and nonsense which happens in in the everyday world. So this by doing this action, if you've got the guts, it opens up the the um, opportunity to go in there and tell it like it is in a court of law. Um, and many activists have done that brilliantly so far. Um, so, yeah, I've talked for 10 minutes now, so I guess I'd better wrap up. Um, so just in summary, I hope that some of you, if you're near to, if you've thought about this, just to consider doing this and maybe just take one further step towards actually taking action because I do doing a national retrofit uh, program which is which is up to scratch is basically it's not going to happen without serious political action and um, and the, the situation is dire everybody here is intelligent enough to understand that and um, so over to you Rue, thank you so much for that incredibly powerful testimony it's uh you know they're, they're they're very important the testimonies at the beginning of all of our insulate britain webinars because they ground us in what what we're really you know what, why we're here why retrofit matters uh, and what then also challenges us to what what are we prepared to do about it so thank you thank you very much personally thank you very much and uh, thank you very much on behalf of of um of the the webinar panel um i'm now going to hand over to chris if that's okay you can introduce yourself and the panel and we can um look at some of the retro questions that have come through thank you uh thank you jill um yeah it's quite hard to follow that actually Ruth. so um and you know pick up and start talking about insulation and, and retrofit but um yeah so um anybody people who don't know me i'm chris herring i'm i was going to say i'm i'm a father and grandfather actually i've got two young grandsons and uh, although i've been environmentally uh, active most of my my life um it's actually looking at them that uh, i think of their future that uh, drives me as much as anything now um i am um, a founding director of the green building store along with uh, another panelist here is a bit incestuous tonight. My my long term business partner, Bill Butcher. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be introducing ourselves in a moment. I'm also chair of the Passive House Trust in the UK. I'm involved in other sustainable building activities. Uh, I'm also a climate commissioner for my local authority and and involved with uh, Yorkshire Humber Climate Commission as well. So I'm sort of active in various ways. Um, I've got a little bit more time to do that. I don't have to run the business uh, quite so much now. Um, so I've been, I was Matthew actually, who's another panelist who would introduce himself, who is, has been an activist, uh, drew me into this last September. Um, and I felt this was something something I could offer to try and pull some of these panels together. And we've run them during the autumn last year, and then we've run a series of, this is the, this is the fourth in the series this year, isn't it? I think, Jill. Um, we, but we've also been working in conjunction with Zero Carbon Yorkshire Buildings Group, and we've got Shady Collis, who's the coordinator of that. And I, I sort of uh, front that, if you like, for her in many ways. Um, so, uh, and that group is a Yorkshire based group. But um, anyway, yes. So tonight we're going to talk about retrofit. That's what you're here for. Um, and we've got a We've got an expert panel. We've had a lot of questions actually. They've been trickling into today. I, I prepared beforehand, and then more questions are coming in. I doubt that we're going to get through them all, but there are a number of themes in there, and that's what I want to draw out really and, and address the strengths of, of the panel. Um, so if we don't get to your question, please don't be offended. And if this goes well, and we've got we're up to almost a record for participants now. I think we had 80 the last one. We're at 78 at the moment. So I think that means that this is popular. And so hopefully we might run another one um with the next webinar coming up we'll tell you about at the end no one's got all the answers to this stuff it's very complicated uh, retrofit um so um i think we'll we'll move on to thinking about the questions but first of all i just ask the panel to introduce themselves very briefly just so you have some brief understanding of their experience of retrofit and i'll start with uh phil if i can Hi folks, I'm Phil Bixby. I'm an architect and passive house designer based in York. I run my own practice. 
um, former chair of York Environment Forum. So I come at this as a, a designer with a kind of passive house background. Lovely. Thanks, Phil. And Richard? I'm Richard Spencer. I'm a passive house consultant and building services engineer. Um, I've just moved from Leeds Environmental Design Associates to Borough Happold, so I've got an experience of doing quite a lot of smaller individual house retrofits, both for passive house level type ones and, and less deep than that, and I'm now moving on to do more commercial buildings that um, apply the same kind of principles to them. Thanks Richard. And Matthew? Yeah, um, so I'm a director of Zero Carbon Yorkshire, um, and it's it's great that we are combined into Labour Britain and Zero Carbon Yorkshire. Um, I've done a couple of retrofits and built a passive house, or close to passive house anyway. Thanks, Matthew. And Bill, could you briefly introduce yourself? <laughs> Um, mute. Oh, yeah. yeah, I found the unmute button. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, um, yes, uh, I've worked with Chris for a long time, as you've just learned. Um, my background, call myself a builder. Well, I was a builder, I'm a builder. Um, um, I've been in it since, oh God, since I was 16, one way or the other. I actually trained as a QS originally. Oh, and by the way, Jill, I don't tell many people, but I was born in Croydon. <laughs> way at five months old but uh, I was born there actually. I uh, feel that Bill I feel <laughs> that <laughs> um, so I originally trained as a QS actually quantity surveyor um, more interested in partying as a teenager to be quite honest uh, and growing a beard and wearing loons and so forth and opted out of uh, chain charters and actually took up tools became a builder with a marina van and a wooden ladder with no uh, no to nuclear power sticker on the side. So that was back in the 70s. Come a long way, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, yeah, so, yeah, from practical building, we sort of, uh, I met Chris back in the 80s and we formed Green Building Store to uh, supply uh, components really that weren't available, both with low toxicity, toxicity and low energy uh, measures, if you like. Um, and we ran that alongside the building, which we've done ever since. Um, and we're trying to hand on to others at the moment, but uh, not very successfully in the sense of uh, I'm still working as much as I ever have done, actually. So we've done a lot of, uh, we built the first passive house in. Uh, Denbydale, one of the first in England, so the English vernacular, and we've done quite a few radical retrofits, both the passive house levels. I'm a passive house consultant and I teach and train passive house to architects and builders. Um, uh, and there we are. Yeah. Thanks, uh, is that enough? Yeah. yeah, that's plenty. Yeah, no, thank you. No, that's good. Um, and I, I do want to say two things about the panel before we move on. I am very much, I feel very much aware that it's an all male panel. That's sort of slightly chance. It wouldn't be my choice, but uh, although all of these panel members would be my choice, perhaps uh, slightly more diverse. And it's a Yorkshire based panel, which I'm very proud to say that. And, and I think very appropriate as we're in conjunction with Zero Carbon Yorkshire. OK, let's move on and, and talk about retrofit. Uh, it's a massive subject. We're not going to get, you know, we're certainly not going to bottom everything. Uh, but we, I will start with a question that we're well, picking up two questions together. Um, Reinhard Huss asked us, um, "What is the process to a whole house approach of retrofitting based on passive house principles?" And then um, Mary Peggington asked us uh, about whole house plan. Um, is there a template? Um, how can how do we do it? Um, and the way putting that together, um, perhaps I'll start with Phil to, to because this is very much your area, isn't it? I think mm. uh, to talk about this. And I'm not going to ask every panelist to talk about every subject because otherwise we'll you know we won't cover enough ground. So um, yeah, Phil. Okay, look, uh, I guess I, I'll, I'll leave the second part of it because the, the idea of a template isn't something I'm particularly expert on, but certainly in terms of how to approach it. I guess the approach I've always taken uh, comes from passive house training, which is using PHPP, passive house planning package, as a, as a design tool. So um, if I'm asked to look at someone's home from the on the basis of how it could be retrofitted, the first thing I'll do is to do a measured survey or get hold of drawings of it. 
um, set up an energy model for it using PHPP. So putting in the building geometry, exploring the building construction as much as, much as possible, poking holes in things in order to find out what they're made of, um, trying to kind of uh, get into the bits of the building which uh, are, are, are tricky to get to, um, to try and get as accurate a model as possible. Um, I'll then usually talk to the clients to talk about what their actual energy use has been in order to then try and refine that model. Um, some of the things where assumptions are made, for example, what air leakage rates are and stuff like that, being able to kind of fine tune the model, knowing what uh, uh, energy, what space heating energy people are actually using is a very useful way of kind of refining it from both ends to get to something which is representative. What PHPP then does is give you um, a really useful tool to show you where the energy is going um, and to therefore give you a starting point to see where the areas are that are going to have the greatest impact. Um, and it's very easy with PHPP to then set up different iterations of, of, of a model to see how different uh, um, elements of the building will contribute towards an overall improvement. And that then forms a starting point for conversation with the client about what is going to be easiest for them to start with and what's going to necessarily be further down the line, whether that's about costs or whether it's about the fact they're living in the house at the time and need to be able to remain there. Um, it's also a chance to talk about issues around comfort um, so that it's not simply about reducing energy use, but it's also about making sure the place is a pleasant place to live and works for people to live there. Um, and I think the, the where uh, I very often find myself is in a situation of, of looking at what can be done initially, what can be done further down the line, but then making sure that the stuff that is done initially is done in a way where there are no regrets about it and you're not undoing anything which um, subsequently uh, would get in the way of better standards down the line. Is that okay as a kind of broad yeah. kind of intro to that? No, no, that's lovely. Thank you, Phil. And what I'd like to pick up as well, I might just ask Richard to come in on this a little bit, is um, the kind of role of passive house and deep retrofit in, in the whole picture. I don't know whether you would feel you could um, comment on that, Richard. Yes, I think I, I think the I think the the the, the point is that I <laughs> I think there's two two ways of looking at this. So there's the sort of the, the top down picture is we have to retrofit how we have to retrofit our buildings to quite a deep level to, in order that we've actually got enough renewable electricity to power them when we've electrified them. So that's kind of the, the top down picture. Um, I think the bottom up picture also says that we should do deep retrofit because if you don't do a deep retrofit, what happens is you take your house that you've probably been heating to 16, 17 degrees and you take the comfort, you heat it to 20 degrees, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's when we when we design a, a full passive house new build, we, we design for 20 degrees because that's a comfort temperature. Um, but the reality is most most houses are operated at much lower temperatures than that. So you're going to take a comfort take. And if you've only done a shallow ret retrofit, the comfort take is going to be there and you won't get any particular energy efficiency benefit. You'll just get the comfort. So you have to go deep from that point of view as well. Um, so yeah, so I think looking at, looking at it from both directions, from a national level and from an individual building level to get the comfort benefits, it needs to be a deep retrofit. Thank, okay, thank you, because I mean, those are the questions people ask, isn't it? So I'm just trying to tease this out a little bit. Um, the, the other bit of the question was around, well, I mean, I'm gonna link it together with, with another question, but around a template. So obviously people don't know where to go and where to start. And, um, and there was another question from Richard Ramsden saying, you know, where, where can you go for advice? Where, where do I start? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm there a household. What on earth do I do? And that's one of the most difficult things for people, isn't it? Now, they can go to somebody like, you know, Phil or Richard or, or Bill or, you know, offering professional services. But what, what, what I, I'm going to come to you, Matthew, actually, and see partly because you've seen this in action in Ireland and the way that they're, now they're rolling out a program. And I'm not asking you to present on that because you're going to talk about it next week, but but just where, what do people do? You know, what, 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 how do they, what should we put in place so that they can find routes to this without, you know, necessarily trying to search out something like Phil or Richard or, or Bill, you know, and trying to find them? Um. Well, I think the first thing is to just acknowledge it is a very complicated thing to do. Um, and an awful lot of people have got very little idea about it. Um, 
And the other thing which I think at an early stage is worth saying is most people have not experienced a comfortable house. It's, it's a little bit about, it's a bit like trying to buy a car when you've never driven or been in a car. So trying to own a comfortable house, which is always comfortable and is low energy to heat, if you've never experienced it, um, that's something you may not realise that it would be nice. So um, first thing would be see if you can get to visit a retrofitted house. Um, how do you find them? Well, you can go on the passive house, have an open day in November, and how do you find a retrofit coordinator or similar? I'd say go along to the AECB website, and there's a whole bunch of experts on the AECB website. That's a, that's a good starting point if you know nobody. Um, if not, just ask everyone that you can think of. Um, do they know anyone who knows about retrofit? And usually there'll be somebody who's able to talk to you. This is a bit of a network, isn't it? Um, Bill, what, what do you, before, I'm, we'll obviously know some of the answers, but what do you say to people when they come and say, where on earth do I go next? You know, where do I start? Well, uh, it is complicated. Uh, you know, I always come from where the person is. Yeah. So, and what the building is as well. So, if I'm, you know, if, and it comes down to money, you know, believe it or not, you know, how much money people got. I mean, that is not what we should have. We should have grants and everything, I know. But in day to day workings, in the way that uh, I deal with people, is um, you explain what the ultimate could be. But actually, for most people, you're ripping out value in a building, which they've paid for or they've got a mortgage for in the first place. So, you know, all of that pragmatic side comes into this. If I walk into a house and it's still in a 1970s state um, uh, and needs rewiring, everything doing, it's yippee, because you're not ripping out value that somebody's paid for. So that's the first thing that I think of. Um, is that enough? Yes, no, that's fine. Well, yeah. Yeah. I could go on all week about I know you, I know you could, because I've seen you do it. That's fine. And no, that, that, that's great. And what I want to say as well is that for those who haven't been at previous webinars, you can watch the recordings of those and um, if you go to the Insulate Britain website. Um, and we have covered um, to some extent what we should be doing in terms of funding. So the New Economics Foundation, very interesting talk, the Great Homes Upgrade, where they looked at the economics of this and said it makes sense to pump, the government should be pump priming it. We had Russell Smith talking about the National Retrofit Strategy, which is a construction leadership council initiative. And they are saying, Government is the key in the lock. You know, you have the government has to provide some longevity to a program and at least unlocking finance. There's plenty of equity out there to match it. So, picking up that financial side, we can't expect everybody in this country to pay for their retrofits. It's not going to happen. So, you know, this has been part of one of the big messages that we've been bringing out in these webinars as well. So, just sort of picking that up, really, Bill. Um, right, I'm going to get down and get. Um, get dirty, so to speak, in terms of, uh, in some of the detail now. Um, where are we? Just looking at time, see how we're doing. Um, so we've had quite a lot of questions around, um, I, sorry, I'm using acronyms, I don't want to do that. IWI and EWI, I was gonna say, that that's internal wall insulation and external wall insulation, and then how that is affected, um, affects the moisture in buildings and, and how, what we have to think about. So we had a question from Derek Lamb, and I'm not going to read all that because it's quite long, but basically he retrofitted his house some years ago um, with soft board, what we call soft, soft fibre based board. So it's 15 millimetre soft fibre based board right down to the um, below the skirting boards. Um, left them bare, water, uh, water based emulsion on them and um, the, the, he finds the, the surfaces much warmer. Um, then the uninsulated rooms and no sign of dampness or condensation. So uh, is there any ways, reason why this cheap, cheap, easy DIY solution should not be used more widely for existing homes? So that's internal wall insulation. Um, then we've had another question Why is from Anthony Hay, why is insulating internally not as good as insulating externally? Uh, it asks, is it thermal mass? 
what choice is there if you live in a stone cottage in a national park? Uh, there are other questions around the same thing as well, but I think that's enough. So I'm just wondering who would like to kick off talking a little bit about use of IWI and EWI, now that everyone knows what those acronyms are. Um, Richard, would you like to start with that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think I think you've got to bear in mind that one of the things with, with retrofit is it's got to be robust. So you don't want to damage the existing building. Um, and, and as you alluded to in the first part of what you were saying, Chris, it, when you insulate internally, potentially that has more issues than when you insulate externally. So when you insulate externally, you're making the existing walls of the building warmer and you're also adding a new skin to the building that's going to protect it from the weather outside. So potentially that reduces moisture risk, potentially. Um, and with internal wall insulation, you have the opposite thing. So you're making the wall colder. Um, you potentially can stop the moisture being able to dry from the inside of the wall. Um, so it, it, it very much depends on the building, as a lot of these things do, um, what kind of construction you've got um, 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 and what condition that building is in, where that building is. So some of the retrofits I know Bill has done have been in very exposed, very exposed positions. So there's real issues with driving rain and that increases the risk. Um, so all of those things come into it as to which approach is going to have, you know, how far you can go and what issues there are going to be around robustness when it comes to moisture. Um, as you say, with, with some areas like in a, in a national park, you might not have a choice one way or the other. It's Could funny. I just ask everybody who isn't, I, I, except the panel, have their microphones turned off, please, just so we're getting a bit of feedback. Sorry, Richard. Yeah. Um, I think I'd finish. I was basically yeah. saying, and, and the one final thought I got on that stone cottage is, um, just because it's a stone cottage doesn't mean it's always had external exposed stone. So it may have originally been rendered, which asks you, what makes you ask a question about kind of whether the building's in the best condition for the building as you're starting from. But it may be because it's not rendered, even though it may originally have been, the planners may say it's got to stay unrendered. And then you've got to deal with that as a potential issue in considering what's the right retrofit for it. Every building is an individual, really, isn't it? You know? Yeah, so I think there's, there's common strategies that can be applied, but every building needs its own individual plan because every building is going to have unique issues. Bill, obviously, I know, you know, we, you, have, have done a lot of work on IWI. You've never done EWI. <laughs> no. no. I, yes, it's one of the sort of goals that I've got, actually, um, to do EWI uh, you know, as, as experience. So we've done quite a lot with, because as you know, we're up here on top of the Pennines uh, with uh, a lot of the older buildings of 450 thick walls with rubble fill, stone walling. Um, and um, EWI is just not practical with um, conditions that we've got around here and planning and people's expectations. Basically, if uh, in Yorkshire around here, if you try and build something that isn't with stone, you get put in the village stocks, metaphorically speaking. So planning and so forth comes into this. So EW, um, IWI, just as Richard's been saying here, um, we don't go beyond a U value and the U value is um, the thermal performance of a, you know, a, a, an element such as the wall um, below 0.35, whereas with EWI, external wall insulation, as Richard's just been saying, you can go as far as you want because you've taken the risk away of uh, rain-driven moisture and interstitial condensation, which is where we reach the dew point within the wall of warm moist air that we're producing inside. And sorry if I'm getting a bit technical now. So we have to think of breathing walls, if you like, in layperson's talk. Um, and each building's uh, its own story, just as Chris and Richard have been saying. So we start looking at, with IWI, internal wall insulation strategies of about 100 mil maximum of, say, wood fiber. Um, or we can get away with um, actually PU, Kingspan Celotex type materials on um, 
cavity wall construction. So it depends on the age of the house and so forth, which we can go into again and again. So um, yeah, we've we've uh, used in a very um, uh, risky situation up here on the Pennines, a material called darsenite, which is from Italy, which is cork and lime, which actually is capillary and vapor open and is the most robust of the systems. They're extremely expensive. Um, Use. Yeah, sorry, Chris. No, that's no, fine. Sorry, I'm, I'm just. Um, yeah. there, there well, is, there's some questions from uh, just to add on to this. So, yeah, some questions from Saren Dean. Um, so, does the original yeah. plaster need to be need removing for internal wall insulation? Is one. Then, what co goes on top of IWI wallpaper or plasterboard? Um, is it continuous from ground to first floor through the through the floor of ceiling space? All very good questions, I think. Um, and is partial IWI an option? So if there are difficult areas, can you just sort of leave them out and do bits? Um, I don't know who to actually, who to, who would like to comment on that. Um, would you, Matthew, you've done some IWI, haven't you? I think. Yeah. In your um, own the moment, if I remember right. I, oh, I'm not, um, not as expert as some of the architects here, but I have done a reasonable amount of it. Um, first of all, on the internal or external, it sounds obvious, but if you can get away with external wall insulation, it is so much easier. Um, having seen it done in Ireland, they've had somebody, a 90 year old who was living in a house throughout a deep retrofit. And she had one day where she had to move out of the room that she normally lived in. You couldn't possibly do that with internal wall insulation. It's much more disruptive. Um, I'd, I'd say um, if you want to stick to natural materials, um, then look at Historic Scotland. I'll just put a link in there. They've done a lot of work on internal wall insulation. So there's some great, great, great studies there. Personally, I've used um, the Kingspan materials because they have a U-value which is twice as good. So if, you, if you're trying to achieve a particular U-value, you can put half the thickness of insulation, and particularly in things like bathrooms, um, stairwells, that sort of thing where space is limited, then you know, it may be appropriate to go for the Kingspan type materials. So, Basically, you can use either Bill's absolutely right. You've got to be very careful about um, condensation cold spots. If basically, if you do want to do partial retrofit, um, I did that on one of the houses. We've retrofitted the upstairs, but not the downstairs yet. Uh, we put in MVHR, so you've got plenty of ventilation. So, haven't got too much problem with mould. But if you if you don't look after ventilation and you do partial um, internal wall insulation, whatever is coldest is where you'll get damp, which is where you'll get mold. So, um, you know, basically be aware of whatever is coldest is going to have damp and cold unless you put in extra ventilation. So you've always got to do insulation and ventilation and air tightness all at the same time. Okay, thank you. Um, Phil, I know you, I know you had your hand up and I missed it for a minute, but um, I'm going to also just feed in another, um, this is a question actually in the chat. I was not intending to take questions in the chat because now the questions you've got ready, but it feeds into it. Uh, what about a house where EWI is sensible on one elevation, IWI has to be everywhere else because of stone on elevations? Yeah. And also a question, the question around Kingspan uh, using petroleum products, uh, not very just stop oil, really. Those, those are the, you want to pick a bit of that up, Phil? Uh, I'll have a go at the first bit of that. Um, you don't have to. You can... <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll chuck in the other things I wanted to say. Really. Um, the first is about um, external wall insulation and internal wall insulation. Yes, I mean, we've got both on, on, on our house here. We needed to keep or wanted to keep or pushed by the planners to keep the brickwork externally on the front and back of the house. So we internally insulated those walls. We've got a gable wall, which we were putting solar panels onto, which was already rendered. We were therefore able to externally insulate that. So we were able to kind of maintain as much internal space as possible and also deal with this issue about, you know, the kind of increased risk of um, doing internal wall insulation by at least narrowing down the areas that we were doing the internal wall insulation. So 
it's, it's perfectly possible to mix the two. And what we dealt with was the points where they met by overlapping the internal and external walling station to make sure we avoided cold bridges in those, uh, those locations. The things I wanted to just say, say what we're about. Um, firstly, the, the big advantage of internal walling station is the ability to do it incrementally, to do it a room at a time, um, which I think then pushes people to, or gives people the opportunity to do a proper job um it's it's dead easy to slap a load of you know kind of one inch polystyrene over every wall and feel like all the walls are going to be warmer because they will be but they won't necessarily be as much warmer as they need to be if we're going to do this seriously so doing the job properly if that means do that you do one room at a time uh, and if it means you can then live in the house and avoid the cost of moving out if it means you can avoid alienating your entire family all of those things then internal wall insulation is brilliant from that point of view the other point I just wanted to chuck in was the, the notion of when you move home being a very key point in your lives and a very key point in this process. Um, and we did a, a workshop last year as part of York Environment Week, which is a bit of a plug, the video for that's still up on the York Environment Week website from last year, which basically said, these are the things you should be thinking of when you move home. And that basically for anybody, all of us here, if ever we're moving home, we shouldn't be looking at a home to move into, which is the home we want. We should be looking at a home which can become the place that we want and that it needs to be in the future. So when you move home, that's a massive opportunity to, to look at um, taking on somewhere and turning it into something better, knowing that you can do the work prior to actually moving into the place and therefore you can really do serious invasive stuff. Thanks, Phil. And where time's moving on, and we have to keep moving with this, so uh, you know we could we could spend an hour on each of these topics. I know that. So um, there, I did want to pick up a question around. Uh, well, not getting too deeply into floor insulation because that's we'll spend another another two hours there. Um, but we've got a question from Richard Ramsden. Um, we hear about loft insulation, but what about floor insulation? So the relative importance of of um, thinking, you know, loft insulation has always been the quick win, um, but also picking up the difficulty. Um, I'm trying to remember who asked. I think we've got several questions actually asking about uh, uh, suspended ground floors, which are the, obviously the, the bugbear of everybody's life. Um, Bill, you wrestle with suspended ground floors a lot. You know, we all do uh, around retrofit. Um, do you want to have a little bit of a talk about loft insulation versus floor insulation? Well, we kind of know, I suppose, that heat rises, so we need loft insulation. But the, the difficulty of, floor, of suspended ground floor insulation. Yes. Well, I mean, if you're lucky and can get underneath it, you don't have to take up the floors and all the, you know, fittings, cupboards, kitchens and all the rest of it. Um, so... That's the first thing. Um, it's better to use uh, fibrous insulation between floor joists rather than rigid insulation, even though uh, rigid insulate, you know, king spans, PU and so forth have got a better um, thermal performance, just as Bill's been saying there. But um, uh, what we've got to do is stop air movement around that insulation. So fibrous fills the gap lot better and takes up any expansion and contraction so and then to try and put a wind tightness uh, but vapor open membrane underneath the timber joists in principle <coughs> which will allow moisture out into the ventilated space underneath but there are great dangers with doing this potentially particularly with older houses that don't have a damp proof course to protect the joist ends. And so that in older houses where you've got suspended uh, timber floor into the wall, uh, sorry, joist into the wall, without into solid walls without DPC, they manage to stay dry and not start rotting because there's a lot of air movement around it. In other words, cold wind when we start insulating, there is a danger of causing trouble with those joist ends into the walls. So it depends on the age of house um, and how to deal with that. Um, otherwise, if you can't get under the floor, I'm afraid you have to take up the floorboards. And what we've done quite often is use that same 
vapor open book wind tightness membrane with tapes and go on up and over the joists. You see what I mean? And then fitted the fibrous insulation, either natural insulation or usually mineral walls uh, in between and put a floor back down. Floors which are uh, like plywood and chipboard actually perform better from our point of view, particularly where they're glued together because they, they um, are an air tightness barrier at the same time. Putting back floorboards uh, with all the gaps between it can potentially um, cause a problem with warm, moist air getting down. So, yeah. Um, yeah. My, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Bill. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, I, I, please do look in the chat. There are some really interesting comments coming up that I can't fully read and, and listen and share at the same time, but um, some useful stuff in there as well. Um, we've not got very long. Um, and uh, you know, I'm aware all of these strands we could explore a lot more. The IWI, we haven't really addressed the, some of the moisture issues more, but um, it's just to give a, people a flavor and um, at least address a few of the, the issues. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, heat pumps and decarbonization, because obviously one of the things we could do to cut carbon emissions as we decarbonize the grid is install heat pumps. Um, and actually, Chaley asked me to ask a question. Um, well, she asked a question around um, how much do you need to insulate with a heat pump? And actually teasing that to two things. One is we know we need to insulate to make a heat pump work well. And the second is we, um, we know that uh, if we just install heat pumps in every building, the grid can't meet that demand. Can I bring come to you, Richard, because you do building services and, and obviously doing a lot of retrofit. Um, how do you see heat pumps? What do you what do you recommend? Yes, I mean, as, as you alluded to, there's that top down thing of like the electricity grid will only have so much renewables on it. And so therefore we've got to do efficiency and we've got to make our heat pumps then work efficiently. Um, so that kind of that kind of sets where we need to get to from one direction, which is as deep as possible. Looking at it pragmatically the other way. Um, so for efficient heat pumps, basically the heat pump's efficiency depends on the difference between the outside temperature. So if it's an air source heat pump, the temperature of the air outside, if it's a ground source heat pump, the more constant, um, but still relatively cool in the winter ground temperature and the temperature that we're emitting the heat at in, in our radiators or under floor heating. So that's, that's what defines that efficiency. So if, to get a heat pump more efficient, we want to run the emitters at lower temperatures. Um, so with underfloor heating, we'd want to be aiming for about 35 degrees. Ideally, with radiators, we'd want to aim for 45 degrees, at most 55. And so what that means is, compared to running with a gas boiler, where we might be running the radiators at 70 degrees C, we need the radiators, we need a bigger area to emit that heat from so we can do it at lower temperature. So, so what that actually drives is a physical constraint in the sense that you can only put physically a certain size of radiators into a lot of spaces. And so that might be your sort of your backstop of I've got to put at least enough insulation in that the radiators I can that, that I can physically get into that room give me a low enough operating temperature that the heat pump will be efficient. And so we have done some projects where that has been like the, the critical question of what temperature we're going to run the heat pump at. Well, I can only physically get the radiators this size in, and I'm only allowed to put that much insulation in because of well, in the case of the project I'm thinking of. Um, historic building type issues where you're very limited on what, what can be done from either an aesthetic point of view or a thinking about moisture in the building point of view. So, so, so when you're sort of up against those constraints and you can only do a relatively small or not as deep a retrofit, then actually it comes down to physically what radiators can I fit into the space um, and, and can I get the heat pump to be efficient. Thank you, Richard. And I'm just realising how much there's to talk about. We've been talking now for well over half an hour and I feel like we hardly started here. So, uh, and there is a, a, an interesting comment from uh, Brian Goodell, uh, uh, well, a question saying, could we, could we, can we do more um, D-tech retrofit? And he's saying, can't we just rip out central heating systems altogether, then insulate seal gaps, install minimal electric heating and wear jumpers? And what I wanted to take from that is, of course, we can live at lower temperatures. I'm not advocating living in damp, cold houses, but um, you know there is an issue around the standard, the sufficiency as well as efficiency. 
you know, we're all talking about efficiency, making buildings efficient. We don't need to live at 22, 23 degrees. Um, you know, we can reduce slightly as well. So just to plug that in. We have reached 7.56 and I promised Jill, well, we would finish for eight and she wants to wrap up. So I'm really sorry, we've hardly started. Um, we've got a lot of, I've got quite a lot of questions here that we could go back to. So I think there might be scope for another one of these uh, moving forward. Um, but I want to thank, in the meantime, thank Phil, Richard, Bill and Matthew for your contributions uh, and realise that we need longer next time, Jill. So um, anyway, and thank you for listening. We've still got an audience of 75, so hardly anybody's left. So that says a lot about how, you know, how interesting and how much we can tease this out. So I'm going to hand back to you now, Jill. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris, and the panel. Just fantastic. I um, held my hands up earlier to not really being, well, really knowing very little. I've been on since became involved with Interlake Britain, a massive learning curve. And I just look, spend a whole lot of time wondering if I'm not doing this utterly selfishly to find out how to sort my own house out. So it's been, you know, it is fantastic. And I do look forward to the next one of these um, as well. I think that would be really great. The reason I wanted to cut a tad early was so that Chris and Matthew could give us a quick heads up of our next webinar, which yeah. won't be one of these, but we must have one. Um, but it is very exciting. So can I bounce back to you, Chris? It's the, so what day of July is it? Jill, sorry, I need to look it up. I can't remember offhand. Um, I'll check the date the, and you can talk about it. 5th of July, isn't yeah. it? 5th of July, always a Tuesday. So it starts at the same time, seven o'clock. It's going to be an hour and a half. And what we wanted to do to wrap up, you know, before sort of the summer break is look at what um, some exemplars from around the world. So we're going to look at what's been happening in Ireland, which is very exciting. And as Matthew said at the beginning, um, you've been over there and looked at um, what's going on there, Matthew, So and, and filmed as well. So I think that's really interesting. I'm hoping to bring in feedback from Italy, the super bonus scheme in Italy, where you can get 110% grant for your retrofit. And also some very interesting um, recent news about developments in France, uh, uh, requirements for um, landlords as well. Uh, and I think I will try and get something in on, on what's going on in Scotland and some really big scale retrofit going on in Scotland. So that's what we're looking at. The internet, you know, uh, getting inspiration from, well, is Scotland national um, yeah, in a sense, but yeah, bringing that in and getting some inspiration. So come back on the 5th of July for some real inspiration to, to send you off for, the, for a summer break. And then we're hopefully we'll be coming back in the autumn for another series of these webinars. Sounds like we'll be doing whenever any questions, Jill. But uh, anyway. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. There was a question about um, future events. Yes, please sign up um, to get the newsletter and then you'll get the dates and the, and the links for events. You'll also get some bonus information and uh, points, <laughs> anything that, that comes along that we you know think is important to, to bring to people's attention. We, uh, send them out monthly so please uh, sign up for those and we can make sure you know what the next uh, event will be and once again huge thanks to our panel as always massive thanks to those who put themselves in out there Rue I'm thinking of you them and Matthew obviously and we have other um, colleagues who have um, put themselves uh, in in the way of non-violent civil disobedience to to really draw attention to the fact that we can sit here and talk about what we need to do, but actually without the government finding themselves in a position where it becomes uncomfortable not to, and the only way really to, to swing the public seems to be to, or to swing the media, is to be in their faces a lot. So I can't thank them enough. Thank you everybody for tonight. Look at that, 59, we're sticking to our timetable. It's been a complete pleasure. Thank you for giving up your Thursdays. Uh, is it Thursday? It is. No. It's Tuesday. Tuesday deal. <laughs> I'm on holiday tomorrow. Sorry, you can see I'm on holiday. <laughs> Have a fantastic evening, everybody, and catch you at the next one. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Thank you, everyone. Well done, Jill. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Matthew. Thank yes, you. that was uh, that was good. It's it's the uh, 
Det är 